Welcome to the One Big Thing Podcast, where inspiration meets transformation. Even today's society, you're talking about all the different social media and all these things that come at us, that we are today as humans, I think we are more visible than we've ever been as a society, right? I can post something and have thousands of people across this world see it. Somebody across you know, the planet, right? Be able to see something in a blink of an eye, just instantaneous. So that, that visibility is there. But what we crave and what we want as humans is to be seen. And that is the behind aspect, right? So it's not about being visible. It's about being seen as a person, right? And, 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 and being accepted with all flaws, right? Well, welcome back to The One Big Thing. I am your host, Steve Campbell. Great conversation today as I have Dave Richards on. Dave is a business coach, a speaker, and the CEO of Elite Performance Associates. So he deals with people every day, both through his staff and through business coaching, consulting. You guys are in for a treat today because we're going to pull out those nuggets that Dave's learned over the course of his career, not just in business, but in life, dealing with humans. And I think it's really going to help a lot of people. And for those that are brand new to The One Big Thing, I'm your host, Steve Campbell. This is an interview style show. I basically built a podcast to encourage myself. I'm 37 years old, got four kids under eight years old. I'm a husband, serve as a chief brand officer for the business that I'm a part of. So I understand brand, I understand identity, and also cultivating and honoring that. So with every guest, I'm very aware of making sure we do a great job of putting them in the best light possible while also bringing those parts out of them. So a lot of my listeners are in their 30s and 40s. They're navigating marriage too. They're trying to be the best parents they can be. They, they, they might be stuck in the season and needing some hope and inspiration. So I found that through doing interview style shows, I get encouraged by hearing the stories of individuals just like you in real time and pulling out from them, man, those tough life lessons that we learn that make us all humans so that we can all realize, one, we're not alone. Two, it's not the end of your story. And breakthrough could be on the opposite side of something you're going to pull out from Dave and I today. So if you're new to the one big thing, please check out some other episodes. Stay tuned, subscribe, follow this show. I think you're going to be inspired by the guests I've had from all walks of life, the NFL, business coaches, Peloton, people moving and shaking and doing some incredible stuff. Dave is no different. Uh, Dave came by way of referral from Scott Savage, who's just savage as can be. He is a dude. Uh, we had an unbelievable interview together where we talked about hope and healing. Dave Dave served, uh, uh, Scott serves as a pastor out in Arizona. And when I get done with every guest, I ask them like, hey, Scott, who do you know that I should interview? And Dave was one of the two names that he gave me. So Dave and I got a chance to connect a couple of weeks ago, do a FaceTime, make sure that he felt good, felt comfortable, wanted to come on this journey. So very excited today to have uh, Dave on the show with me. And Dave, for those that don't know you, we did the little introduction at the beginning. What are we missing? Why don't you fill us in? What are we working on today? And then kind of how did we get to this point? Yeah, I love that. Thank you, Steve. It's an honor to be here with you. Uh, Savage is, a, is just a dear friend of mine. And uh, anyway, super excited uh, to just be able to have some time with you today uh, to kind of go over. So again, as you introduced, business coach uh, and obviously run uh, Elite Performance Associates, which is a consulting uh, coaching firm, right? And we work with top organizations across the nation, uh, different types of organizations in different industries, uh, but primarily working with the leadership group of guiding or providing and kind of uh, clarity around direction, execution, and scaling of those companies that are there. And so uh, we've been doing that for just over almost six years now, uh, my partner and I, uh, Dana DeVito. And so um, it's been a joy uh, to be able to do that. And so kind of what brought me you know, to that part of it, uh, to kind of go dive into kind of the past part, right, that you're going through with it is um, I'm a father of four uh, incredible children, uh, ranging from 17 down to 10, two boys and two girls. Uh, my beautiful wife, Amber, we've been married for 21 years. Uh, so super cool there. Um, and been uh, a neat deal and, and just a life partner, um, you know, across the board, which I will tell you, I think uh, I tell my, my sons, especially, but my kids, the number one decision beyond obviously giving your life to Christ, I would say your number one decision for trajectory of life is who your life partner is, who, who you marry um, in life is, uh, is such a big deal. And so um, anyway, Amber, um, it, you know, we've been together 21 years and, and it's been a great deal. So, um, so yeah, we're in Prescott, Arizona, uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful out here in Prescott. And so anyway, it's great to be here with you. 
Yeah, so I think you might, outside of Scott, be my second, you know, Arizonian uh, coming <laughs> on, which, you know, when you build a vision uh, and you don't even know what it's going to look like, it's just, again, I was in a place in my life over a year ago plus now because we're 30 plus episodes into this thing recording where, again, uh, sometimes the blessings of life, if you're not careful, can become burdens. And you never want to say that when you're going through it. But when you're raising four kids like you did, like I am, uh, when you are you know, involved in leadership in your business life and making decisions, not just for your business, but the well-being of your staff, clients, future trajectory, and then you have this life partner at home and your spouse who many times needs you to be even more for them. And I've always joked around and said, I, I spent so much of my life giving the world Superman and my wife always got Clark Kent and it just mm. wasn't fair. And yeah. so I think feeling the weight of that, I never felt bad for myself, but just the weight of it. Like, man, am I even doing what I'm supposed to be doing? I believe, Dave, that there are so many listeners out there today that whether they'll raise their hand and admit that's me, or they're just like, oh, okay, maybe this episode's worth my time. I think there's a lot of people struggling out there today, um, not with overt sin of like, should I kill somebody? Should I not? You know, should I go do this egregious thing or not? But more of just, man, I, I've allowed some stinking thinking into my life. I've allowed some self doubt. I've allowed some negative talk to breed too deep of roots in my life that I just don't feel like I'm the best husband or wife. I just don't feel mm -hmm. like I'm the best parent. I just don't feel like I'm showing up the way that I want to. And maybe they feel alone and isolated. And so again, you said following Christ is the biggest part of your life. I never meant to start a Christian podcast. I don't think the one big thing is a Christian podcast, but it's my heart. It's my flavor in life. It's how I do everything that I do. And so many of the people that I love doing life with kind of have the same experiences. They screwed up the majority of their life. They made a ton of bad decisions. They were introduced to this person called Jesus and their life was totally transformed. Doesn't mean that life is perfect. Doesn't mean that they always get it right, but there's a purpose now to life that we want to, again, even if you're not a person of faith, don't tune out because I believe that, you know, from uh, Dave's business background, coaching and consulting, there's some things that are going to come out. So, you know, you're, you're dealing with the top of the top leaders. Yeah. Right. Yep. And so, you know, did you always uh, pursue a life of coaching? Was there something prior to this? And coaching is just kind of what you stumbled into. Kind of yeah. what has that career path been like for you? I love that question. You know, Steve, uh, my journey, right? Just kind of give you that from that standpoint, I'll give the abbreviated background. Um, but I come actually from being both a military brat and a PK kid, right? So kind of got the double whammy. So my pops was 20 years in the military. Um, so I was raised all over the world, actually graduated high school in Germany, um, spent two years in Europe, uh, and then came back to the States for, uh, for school wise, uh, for college. And then he also spent 20 years in the ministry, kind of had a little bit of a bookend before he went into the military, had a few years, and then also after military, he went back into the ministry that was there. So that kind of gives you a little bit of a texture and flavor for my background, what I kind of came from, et cetera. And we can pull in any of that stuff that's there. But one of, one of the things uh, from uh, that you kind of shared kind of that launched me into where I'm at today, but kind of the preface of it beforehand is as a young boy, I remember watching my father and really being inspired by him being a commander in the military and the army um, and how he poured into young men and women, these soldiers and the lives of their families and, and just watching the impacts of how these individuals that were maybe, you know, having difficult times, but they came to him for you know, again, just for wisdom for, you know, what do I do? How do I handle this? And, and the way that he handled the way that he influenced the way that he led them just really struck me ever since I was, you know, just a young little, little boy, right? Five years old. And so it kind of began my curiosity and my real drive of, you know, learning about leadership and really kind of being a student around that part of it that's there. And so, you know, two things that I really took from, uh, you know, that ob observation of my my pops that have kind of continued to resonate with me uh, within it is that number one, the way that he treated his soldiers and the people that he worked with is that everyone has a story and every story matters, right? Everybody's got a story and every story matters. And then number two, the world and people are craving for strong leaders to help them you know, guide this, this, this difficulty of life. Um, that led me in and after school wise, got into the financial world. I was 23 years into the, the mortgage banking world, um, led multiple teams, multiple states and, and different areas around that. 
Um, and then a series of events occurred uh, back in the 2007-8 range uh, that was there. Um, uh, that was there uh, that started things. I got affiliated with John Maxwell, a strong influence with me, uh, went through uh, coaching with him uh, and actually got an opportunity to go to Paraguay uh, with John and several other coaches uh, for a one week time frame. Uh, it was incredible. Um, I always saw leadership and coaching kind of how I did what I did. So I was in the mortgage industry um, and it was kind of how I did those things, but it never, you know, I never thought about it as something like could be what I did. Right. Um, in terms of, you know, the what aspect. And so after that, um, kind of came back, I had several speaking pieces that kind of came through, et cetera, uh, that kind of built upon that. And actually it was 2018, excuse me, not 2008, uh, that was there, um, that then kind of drove this idea of going, Hey, um, kind of had a, you know, kind of this really, you know, kind of thought wise that I needed to process with my wife to go, honey, I, you know, this is tough. Like you're saying, I mean, we got four kids, you know, that we're trying to raise through. They're all into sports. We got, I mean, club sports. I mean, just it's, it's chaos, right. At the Richard's house, uh, with those type of things, I got this full on job, you know, and career in the financial industries and leading a large team. And then all of a sudden I got this speaking pieces. I had a pastor come and ask me to coach him. I had some other opportunities that kind of came through that was on the side. And it was like, what do I do with all this? And so we just, we spent several months in prayer and uh, made that decision to say, you know what, we're going to, we feel led that this is the time to, to stop a 23, 20, you know, 23 year career um, and say, you know what, it's time to move away from this and go all in on the coaching uh, and consulting phase. And that's what kind of led me to kind of move to elite performance, uh, building it, and then uh, adding coaches and Dana along the way uh, to build out uh, our firm. So Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Not Quite Right Media. If you love podcasts and enjoy hearing from creators that aren't afraid to tell you what you need to hear, then check out NQR Media. Their podcasts unapologetically broadcast genuine truth to whoever wants to listen. And their shows cross a wide spectrum of topics, from leadership development to personal improvement, as well as getting the most from your money and life. Who doesn't love that? So start following their shows today at www.nqrmedia.com. That's nqrmedia.com. Yeah, I, I think one of the words that can be kind of misconstrued in a bad way, in a good way, is the word exposure. Um, yeah. Folks, you can be exposed to a lot of crap in 2024 that you should never be exposed to. But in your case, 2018, being exposed to John Maxwell and the leadership training, probably changed the trajectory in your life in a way that you never could have imagined. Because once you saw the impact, like no one's going to blame you if you stay in mortgages and you stay in banking because you're making yeah. an impact. It's just, you're helping the people at the place that you are, but, but mm -hmm. it's through products, it's through lending. But when you experience John Maxwell in real life transformation, maybe not to the degree of, you know, the military training that your dad had, but the impact is there. And I think that's something that I want to encourage every listener with today. Uh, the means as to how you do it, whether it's the military, whether it's John Maxwell, whether it's with your kids at home, there is there is no one that's better, but there's one that's right for you. And I, and I just don't want somebody to limit their self, their expectations or their experience in life because they're not on stage in front of people or they're not a military general. You could shape one life at a time. So just don't ever negate the season and the people God's put in your life right now, but be honest with yourself that if you're, is there more that you could be doing? And it's mm. not, it's not striving. It's not being better for better sake, but being honest about yourself. Um, because I, I would say that I think today my experience has been that the world and the media would tell you that people don't want to be told what to do or who to be. And I believe that wholeheartedly, but it's almost been so, um, massaged out to believe that like you can't you can't say anything to anybody without offending them and you have to yeah. let people do them there are a lot of people trying to do them that still feel absolutely lost and so i think that there's never been a greater hunger passion whether it's quietly and somebody would be afraid to raise their hand that i think people are so um they're so hungry for authentic truth they're so hungry for real relationships they're so mm -hmm. hungry for someone to speak life to them and to recognize them. And we can mask, we can mask things that are happening in our life through what media and society are saying is appropriate and right and wrong and get behind movements and do stuff. But like there's a lot of broken people on the other side of that movement. 
there's a, and it could be whatever's coming to your head right now, but you see it in the news every night. You see it in what's going on around the world that people, I think, desire and belong, they desire community. And so they're getting behind things that they believe are creating community for them until they meet a Dave Richards that speaks life to their identity, that speaks life to their purpose. And all of a sudden, you can de arm and de escalate people's aggressiveness when you get to heart issues. Mm-hmm. And I think what's really hard for all of us today is there's so many surface level, altruistic, big things that are being chanted and shouted and everybody is so loud that it's like, how do you, how do you get to the heart when so many people are putting up defense modes? And so when your world is coaching, Mm -hmm. I got to imagine that there is things you have to do to break through to people that you are trustworthy. You know, just because you walk into an organization and you're dealing with leadership doesn't mean that they're all open arms. Dave, we're so glad you're here. What do you want to know about what we're going through? You have alpha personalities that don't like being told what to do. Oh, yeah. You have individuals that don't want to be told that what they're doing may not be the best way. They have protected and safeguarded who they are as a person to get to where they are. And then here's Dave Richards coming in and your business partners trying to identify that things could be different. What is that experience like for you working with leaders? to, I don't know, break through in a way or let them know that like, guys, I am here to help you. Are there exercises? Are there experiences? Are there things that from the moment you're introduced that you do that just allows you to build that human connection that many times is missing for them? Man. Um, Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, And Steve, I think, you know, one of the things um, that I would say um, you know, a couple of different things. Uh, number one, being curious about them, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I know that it was shared, uh, you know, I'm obviously here, you know, the Maya Angelou quote, right, is that people don't care what you say or what you do. They care about, you know, uh, how you made them feel, right, is what they're going to remember. I carry that forward a little bit further than what Maya says, because I think the more important area that moves into the influence, which is what you're talking about, is how do you create influence with these businesses, business leaders, you know, coming from the outside and building that trust within them. It's more than just how you made them feel, but it's how you make them feel about themselves. Um, You know, one of the things that I've shared before is that I believe in today's society, you're talking about all the different social media and all these things that come at us, that we are today as humans, I think we are more visible than we've ever been as a society, right? I can post Mm -hmm. something and have thousands of people across this world see it. Somebody across, you know, the planet, right? Be able to see something in a blink of an eye, just instantaneous. So that, that visibility is there. But what we crave and what we want as humans is to be seen. And that is the behind aspect, right? So it's not about being visible. It's about being seen as a person, right? And, 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 and being accepted with all flaws, right? You know, my challenges, my insecurities, my deficiencies that are there, rather than feel like I've got to put this facade on of the mask. And I think the, the number one, when I get into businesses, number one, the beginning side of that has got to be able to unfold and talk with those leaders that I'm working with. Number one, for them to know that I'm for them, right? Uh, that I'm going to be here. I'm here to help you uh, and help this organization. And so my, again, motive in a, you know, is right, is, is, is in alignment, is, is exactly with that part of it um, and building that trust is to see them, right? To see through their eyes, what they're seeing, you know, what's going on and make sure that we're able to kind of have some conversations around that side of it and build that and continue to build trust within it so that when I come in to make bigger recommendations or maybe challenges or kind of shine a mirror in some of the areas uh, that needs to go through, I've already got an established trust built with them that they know I'm coming, you know, out of, you know, again, love for them, right? Uh, one thing, I've got two things that pop up on my phone every single morning uh, as a reminder. The you know, first thing is actually a verse that just talks about walk in a manner worthy of your calling. Um, the mm-hmm. second thing is to wake up and every day look to value, to believe in, and to love people. And so that whole thing of making sure that people are seen is showing them that I value you. I value your your experiences. I value what you've got uh, to bring to the table. And as a human, uh, maybe the struggles are there. So I think that building of trust is super important. It's less about me telling them about me or me trying to sound interesting or my experience. What I find what breaks the walls down is when I come in and I can learn about them and learn about the organization. That's what builds that trust. 
Yeah, you broke my heart there for a second, Dave. I thought you were going to say one of the two things that you do every day is listen to the One Big Thing podcast. But hey, that's, <laughs> maybe someday, maybe someday we're going to get that special place. I, I think, and maybe what I've experienced, because I've worked uh, in different realms in my life. I've been in corporate America, but with my uh, people that I work with, we own and operate our own small business, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so there's differences, right, in terms of how corporations ran versus a smaller entity. And I think, especially in leadership, um, between human resources and everything else, you are dictated to what you can say and what you can't say because it has to mm. be on brand. And there's probably been not a greater time in history that people want to speak their mind and their opinion about what they're seeing and what their experience is as humans. But when you're a leader, you very times are filtered because companies don't want you posting or resharing or doing things. So there's like this aspect to your life that probably outside of cookouts and one-on-one -on -one dinners you might be playing the company part, but man, when you get alone with people that you know, you talk politics, you talk life, you talk about things that are bothering you that if you said in the workforce, you might be fired or they might raise a red flag or report you. And so, man, when you're dealing with leaders in a, in a, and if you've never been a leader and a CEO, I'm wondering about parents. I'm wondering about couples. Mm -hmm. When you are the one that are making decisions, sometimes there's nobody feeding the back end of who you are. And it could be a very, leadership is sometimes a very lonely place. And, and it's very hard when you have these executive leaders that are probably trying to do the right thing while protecting their own well-being and making sure that they're taking care of their family. They're hiring and firing individuals, which is not a fun experience. I mean, you can become a little bit more calloused over time to it because, again, you're trying to remove yourself from the emotional side of it. But when you're coming into an organization and dealing with the people at the top, they have a duality to them that the average person doesn't because they're thinking about the well-being of the business. They're thinking about the bottom line, but they're also thinking about where's the personal and professional development for them because they're at the top. And it's mm -hmm. not like they're going to be mentored by a lower employee mentoring them. So many times they as individuals aren't getting the resources that they're pushing downstream to the organizations that they're bringing to them. And it can be a very lonely place. I also think, though, that's very similar to the experiences many of us are having as parents, where we are supposed to know everything. We're supposed to know what to do. Our kids look to us. Other parents are watching us. And I think what's hard is, like you said, it's chaos in the Richards home. And I appreciate that. Because sometimes I say the word chaos and my wife gets on me and she's like, <laughs> you got to stop saying the word chaos because it makes it sound like something is wrong. It's not wrong, but it is a little bit chaotic when the Odyssey van doors swing open and there's goldfish, goldfish come popping out or like, yeah. you know, limbs and arms. And it's like, man, you know, when my van shows up at the ball field or at church and like kids take off running and it's just like, man, you sometimes, you sometimes can begin to wonder, like, am I a good dad? Mm. Am I a good parent? My kids are a little wild right now. And, and so like, if there's not places that you can, outside of a one-on-one -on -one time with the Dave Richards or discipleship groups or something, man, parenting can be a very lonely experience because of, like you said, so much of our life is lived on social media and what people are posting that, um, you know, you, you see the perfect family photos posted and everybody's happy and um, you know, you, you can think like, man, the last time we took family photos, we almost got divorced and we almost <laughs> gave away three of our kids. There, there is this, and this is what I wanted to arm listeners with today. Don't, don't put expectations on yourself that no one else is putting on you. You don't have to be a perfect parent. You don't have to be the perfect spouse. But you got to be faithful to the process and you have to be willing to acknowledge that maybe I don't always get it right. And then don't allow, don't allow the things that are pointed out in your life, which are really hard sometimes to cope with. You know, when somebody points out in you like, Dave, we got to talk, man. Like, I don't know if you realize this, but you're kind of diminishing when you say these things. Man, it hurts when you, when yeah. you have things brought to you and you're like, that wasn't even my intent at all. I'm going to work on that. When things are brought to you, whether it's through self-discovery or it's mm -hmm. pointed out to you through accountability, however you want to do it, when things are pointed out to you, do not allow yourself to become a victim and become bitter That's and right. almost close yourself off. So I'm curious, you know, you do the business coaching, you do probably yeah. personal coaching as well. Mm -hmm. What is that process like? Because so many, so many of us are on a journey of 
professional, you know, personal growth. We read a book, Tony Robbins, John Maxwell, and then begins this cycle of like our own dealing with things. But when you come in as a coach, as an accountability person, what, what is that process like for you? Or what have you learned over the years of doing this? That is not like the blueprint for life change, but when you get somebody who may not even realize their own blind spots, what is the coaching process like? And how long does it take? Like, this is a complicated question, Dave. Life mm-hmm. change. How long does life change actually take? Mm. You know what I mean? Like, if somebody yeah, out there is listening cool. today yeah. and they're like, yeah. man, I want my life to change. I'm not saying it takes three weeks, 21 days, and your body's going to change and take this thing. But like in your experience, is it hours? Is it number of meetings? Is it just a daily thing? Like... When you've had people come back to you and say, Dave, you changed my life, mm. what what is that time like sometimes look like? You know, I, I think it varies, right? It can vary uh, and it can also vary based upon what are the things that we are working on in terms of that overall change, right? And sure. so sometimes it's, you know, we talked about how life goes uh, and really a lot of times it's looking at and sometimes I'll describe it as this burners and you think about like a stovetop burner and you got like four burners that are there. And when you look at life, you know, you got your physical, right? So my body, my physical being in shape. Um, that's there. I've got relationships with my wife, maybe my children, close friends. You know, I've got, you know, my business, right? Um, and so either whatever that business is, my job, my career, how I provide, right? And that financial component. And then that spirituality or mindset, you know, depending upon whether there's faith or, you know, whether someone has faith in their life. And because we work with non-believers all the time um, that's there, but that spirituality. So you got these four burners. And I think number one to your point is, is understanding that you can't burn every burner at maximum height all the time. And you just can't keep like every burner where I'm at ultimate physical shape and I'm spending three hours a day at the gym, right? Uh, that's coming through with this. And my 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 relationship with, with my wife is on fire um, and that we are just absolutely in sync and it's just incredible and coming through and my kids, you know, are per- you know, everything's just perfect in that aspect. And the business is over here. And I, and I think I've got all these burners going through. And I think it goes to what you were saying earlier about is that we hold ourselves accountable based on these snapshots that we may see on social media of these burners being at this maximum deal. And sometimes what I find and what I have found over my life, you know, going is there are times where burners got to move at different levels. And so sometimes I got to turn a burner down and I got to talk with my wife and go, look, hon, I need some time here because I've got to focus here or whatever. And we make these joint decisions about how we need to kind of focus within that. Um, So I think it, so I look at it in that quadrant, the the kind of the four pieces, right? When we look at that uh, from a transformational aspect of where we need to focus and come through with it. We traditionally come in on the business side of things. And then we, we come through into the, you know, the personal aspect. So we come through the, the, the door of business and then move into the personal piece versus personal to business uh, from that standpoint. So traditionally, we're working on that business area, but then also building them as a strong leader, right? And influencer in their own, like their world that's going to come through. So as far as transformation, I think, again, it depends on where we're moving it. I believe we're all lifelong learners. And so I think transformation is a series of just this overall trajectory of life of growth, right? Is as long as I'm moving forward on on that other part. I would say uh, getting definition. So you talked about process. We've got to get really clear. Most people, when we first talk with them, they're really, and we start asking them about who they want to be uh, from that standpoint. So it's this be, do, have uh, process piece, but it's, most people will tell and have strong clarity about what they don't want, right? Maybe they they have a father, you know, figure in their life that was not a good role model, was was not there for them, did not provide or or was abandoned or something was, you know, you know, that obviously was 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 a negative influence that was there or they yeah. came away from a job where they had a boss, right, that was not who was not a good leader, right? Didn't care about them, was trying to use them, you know, in those type of areas. But many times we get most, we, we, we devise kind of where we want to go based upon what we don't want in life versus mm-hmm. how do we actually select in a destination of who we actually want, where we really want, what, what are we looking for? And not just in a physical, like materialistic, but 
who do we want to be? And so if we can create that definition of it, then now it's a series of defi- of decisions every single day to make choices, uh, to move that, to move the needle to becoming more that person, which then creates the transformation at a lightning speed, right, area that's going to come through. Because if I can select this is who I want to be, then today I can make that decision that I'm yeah. going to be this type of father. I'm not going to be perfect. I'm not going to make every decision that way. But if I want this relationship with my with my children, then today I can make a decision and I can create transformation there. And then there's the series of decisions every single day that then shows up that picture to go, wow, my life got changed. It's funny, Dave. I feel like if we got to hang out in real life, we would just laugh our head off. Because when mm-hmm. you started telling the analogy of the burner, I was like, please tell me the secret to your coaching is you tell people to create burner accounts and just <laughs> go nuts on social media. But I love, <laughs> I love that concept because like one thing that I... So I'm not a, I hate the word influencer. I'm just a guy who lives my heart on my sleeve and I just live out there, whatever you want to call that. But I'll post stuff and I always have over the years, just thoughts that Holy Spirit puts on my mind that I post and I don't always know why I'm posting it. Many times it's not even things I'm dealing with. It's just like a thought pattern. And it's crazy the amount of people that in real time, but also months later will reach out to me and be like, dude, how'd you know? And I'm like, how did I know Mm -hmm. what? And they're like, what I was going through. And you can tell when when people are dealing through hard things. So concepts that are really near and dear to my heart are depression. My oldest brother went through seven years mm-hmm. of clinical depression. So I never really went through it, but I experienced it through the life of my brother. And I'm just super sensitive to the fact that people deal with depression. They deal with suicidal thoughts. A lot of yeah. people dealing with uh, infertility out there today. And I bring it up on every episode because I have new listeners all the time. And if you've ever struggled with wanting kids and it's not happening, man, yeah. don't give up. My brother went through 11 years of infertility. So I'm just really aware of that. So when I post stuff on social media about infertility, my wife and I got four kids. It's not like that's what I'm dealing with, but I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm keenly aware and sensitive to the fact that the world is bigger than I am. And when the Lord puts on my heart, like, this is something people are struggling with, the means that which I, I'm not sending out letters in the mail to people around my community. I post on Facebook, this was on my heart today, and people respond to it. So I've always, you know, kind of done that. And I think, I think the challenge is one of the things that came to my mind one day was like, have we even ever really defined what a good day is for us personally? Mm. And I think it's very easy to have the grandiose huge whatever ideas about what makes a good day, but just like super practical. Let me tell you what makes a good day for me. Is my phone fully charged? (laughs) Sounds stupid. But like when my phone is charged, I feel like, okay, we're not going to run out of battery today or if I needed to do so. Like having a fully charged phone is pretty good for me. Uh, Being consciously aware of brushing my teeth multiple times. I know that sounds terrible and really bad hygienically, but when you got kids and life is on the go, you just forget to do stuff sometimes. So like, did I take care of myself in that way? Um, Did I eat the things that I was supposed to eat today? Did I meal prep? Did I take care of my body? Um, Is our clothes in our bedroom folded? You know, one of the things as a parent, when you got young kids, it's like your bedroom can become an overflow of your laundry room. And when you've got multiple kids and you're doing multiple things of laundry, your bedroom can be a mess. And so a small victory for me is like my room is clean, my bed is made. And so like these seem so trivial, but like I really did identify things that every single day that if I'll do, they're manageable. Like changing the world is friggin' hard. I don't even know if I'm doing anything. You know, like wanting to be ripped is a great idea. But if you keep eating the stuff you're eating, you may not get there. It's just too big of a goal. So I would even encourage you guys, because I did this myself, identify those things for you and only you know you, that when that thing happens, you're like, okay, I feel pretty good. Take in vitamins. I mean, I don't know what that thing is and jot those things down because... As you get through the course of the day, as life gets away from you, as your mind overwhelms you, the brain is a beautiful thing, but it's also a playground of just chaos. Your brain and your emotions can throw you from one end of the room to the other. But if you've got these small little things that every day you know, if you'll do them, will make it a good day, then everything else could just kind of happens and you can go with the flow. So I would encourage any listeners, and Dave, I don't know if there's any practical things to what I'm saying or what you've done, Absolutely. but just acknowledging, like, what do you need to do every single day to tell yourself, 
today was a good day. Has there been anything in your coaching experience that you've done as you've moved from the business to the personal uh, frameworks, worksheets, mm -hmm. like skills? Like, is there anything that somebody that's listening to the show could do on their own today that might just create a framework for them for like how to make decisions or just kind of how to think through their thoughts? Hey everyone, Steve Campbell. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Uh, if it's made an impact on you, I would love to take a moment to ask you to subscribe to this podcast so you never miss an episode. But I would also love for you to leave a five-star rating and review. Your ratings and review help other listeners know that this show is worth their time. So thank you so much for tuning in to The One Big Thing and let's enjoy the rest of the episode. Yeah. I mean, and, and kind of utilize what you what you just shared, because I think it's so important because when you can define those little things, then actually I can actually determine which of those things do I need to change to mm. get the impact or get the shift that I'm looking for in life in a trajectory aspect, right? Yeah. So if I can identify those things, then it also allows me to identify what needs to change. And I can make those small changes that add up, right? I can engage the compound effect. Uh, one of the frameworks or the tools that we use uh, that, I, that I created is called the mind's eye. And so what I find is, is that kind of utilizing dates or times, for me at least, and so it was kind of one of those things I built for myself and then all of a sudden found that it was really useful for all my clients and just kind of utilizing it from a personal side of it. But this idea of anchoring, you know, like my age, right? So, you know, I turned 49 years old, you know, or 49 years uh, this, this year. So I'll be 49 this year. So I start with, you know, the 49 year old Dave. And then I talked about those four burners of life that we've talked about. And then writing facts of each of those, where am I at physically and being honest with myself uh, from that standpoint. And so anybody can do it. You don't have to have the tool itself, but it's just getting out a piece of paper, writing out how old are you, and then defining and, and, and being factual, right? Here am I at physically? Am I in the best shape I've ever been in? Am I in pretty good shape? Um, you know, have I kind of let myself go? I mean, what, where am I at in a physical side of that? You know, I've been married for 21 years. What's the relationship with my wife look like today? And being honest with it, what does that relationship look like? It? Um, I've got a 17-year-old son, a 16-year-old daughter, you know, a 14-year-old daughter and a 10-year-old son. What are those individual relationships look like, right, from that standpoint? So those relational aspects, what does my business look like and finance look like? And then where am I at spiritually and with my walk? And for me, it's that where, where's my walk with the Lord? Am I feeling close? Am I feeling distant? Uh, am I in the word daily? Uh, do I, you know, do I have men in my life or women in my life that are pouring in, that are holding me accountable with that walk that's coming through? Where am I at with those four areas? The framework then begins then where I subtract seven years from my age now. So then I want to look and see and do that same comparison of the 42 year old Dave. Where was I in each of those areas? And what I find, and then I create, you know, this conversation of the 42 year old Dave talking to the 47 year old Dave, how to, or 49 year old Dave, how'd I do? I mean, so did I grow in some of these areas? Did, you know, we mentioned this earlier, just with my own journey and the journeys that you've observed in other people in the business side of it, seven years ago, would I've ever thought that I would be running a co coaching and consulting firm, you know, seven years ago, kind of just, Hey, I'm going to try this. I'm just jumping off the cliff and we'll see what happens. And Shoot, eight years ago, I was, you know, diving into just the mortgage industry. I mean, nothing even remotely close. So you'll see these things where life changed or this life, you know, complete life impact or this, you know, uh, shift that we're talking about is going to be in your face that you've already seen, like you, it's already happened to you, which then creates this idea that I can do it again. Like I can be more intentional of the direction. So then the next step is I add seven years. So then I'm 49. Now I'm going to talk to the 56-year-old Dave. Who do I want to be in each of these categories? Um, a specific example I'll give you, um, Steve, is relationally. And so I had a fantastic uh, relationship with my father. Um, he passed away uh, years ago. Uh, but we great relationship as a kid. And one of the things that was really important to me uh, as having children and, and specifically sons is I wanted to make sure that I had a really strong relationship uh, with each of my children and some a specific relationship uh, with my sons, right? To help them, you know, to not feel alone, right? And being, you know, a man and a leader uh, in this world that was there. And so I wanted to figure out and think through like, how do I have this relationship with them? And I don't know about you uh, in re regards to your children that's there. My kids, some of, you know, one of them's very different than me. My oldest is very different. Like we don't communicate at the same, like, you know, he's, 
uh, much more introverted. Like he thinks through things. He, he doesn't like to verbally process and those kind of things. And I'm like, hey, man, let's just go for a walk. Let's go talk. And I kept finding these areas where, um, you know, we just didn't connect. Right. And I'm trying to figure out how do I create this connection with 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 my son um, that was there. And it, it, none of the ways that I would connect worked for him. And so I kept finding and, and as a leader, we're called. I, it's my responsibility, not his. It's mine to find the way in to connect with him. And so finally tried, I, I think I listened to, you know, something that was there, but you know, I decided, Hey man, I'm going to try this journaling thing. And so, you know, he was 10 years old, uh, went and did the, the talk, right. Uh, from that point, kind of introduced this idea of, Hey man, what, what about this journaling idea? Three months goes by, he didn't write anything in it. I was trying to kind of write with them a little bit and see if that would help open them up. You know, it took him a little bit, but all of a sudden he wrote his first excerpt, right? And just kind of wrote. And we went three years daily. He wrote me every single day. And some of those journal entries to me was like just simple little things that happened in life. And some of them were questions that, like I shared, I had a great relation with my father. There were questions that I would have been embarrassed to ask my dad. And I'm going, wow. But it opened this intentionality, right? It's kind of creating how do I look for ways, again, this overall trajectory of how do I develop this relationship with my son and finding those little things each and every day uh, that makes and creates that relationship. So it's just a, a small example of, again, creating intentionality in each of those areas, um, again, so I can have that conversation of who I want to become. Yeah, I think the struggle that a lot of people have, uh, my own experience, but talking with individuals, I think we struggle with making sense of the present right now. Mm. It's very easy to look to the future, this unforeseen time that's never been experienced and create a mirage of what it's going to be and life will be yeah. easier when X, Y, Z, and it's almost like escapism. We can do the same thing with the past. Like if we've gone through horrific things, we're probably not using mm -hmm. our past as like a you know, bow and arrow to launch us into the future. Yep. But we can also convince ourselves that life was easier years ago. And if you could go back those seven years to your younger self, I'm sure the things that now in hindsight, you look back and you're like, hey, we're okay. <laughs> when you were in the midst of that, That's it right. was like, God, where are you? This is never going to be worse than it is right now. And so we can easily reflect backwards in a way that's not even fair to what we went through, but also idolize the future in a space that may never happen. And yeah. I think if you're looking for a podcast, that's going to give you the most successful people that give you the big bumper sticker things. You're in the wrong place, mm -hmm. folks. My whole vision for this show was, mm -hmm. man, what if I could bring you people that are implementing real life change, either for themselves or for others? but give you practical resources and insights that can truly help you not feel an arm's length from Dave and be like, that's great for you, man. But like, I'm stuck. That little exercise that you just walked us through is super palpable and it's easy for all of us to do because I think yeah. the component that I heard through all of that is you got to be honest. Like there may be of those four burners, three of them that you're just crushing it. Spiritually, right. financial, mentally, relational, you are just crushing it but physically. Physically, you know you're not, there's some yeah. shame. Or physically, you could be giving of yourself to CrossFit, to whatever meal prep in, to no sugar, to carnivore, to T-Rexian. I mean, I don't even know what they are at this point. You could be crushing your health because that's very individual. I mean, you could be prepping mm -hmm. for yourself and taking care of your body. Your body's a temple. I love that. But relationally, you just don't interact with people. Spiritually, yes. you've never felt farther than God. Financially. Yes. You're broke, but you don't want to admit it, or you make mm -hmm. bad decisions that lead to your finances. And, you know, so I think, you know, money and passion, for those of you who don't know, I, because I don't talk about it, I have the honor of co hosting a financial planning podcast called Ditch the Suits, where we talk about how to get the most from your money in life. We've been very fortunate, yes. Travis and I, over the last three and a half years to be named one of the best finance podcasts out there. You're talking to a guy who 15 years ago, I was in school to be a teacher. I thought I had way too much personality as a kid growing up to work in a cubicle. And so when my guidance counselor, Tom, came to me in middle school and was like, what do you want to do with your life? I had no idea, but I knew that I didn't want the stresses of working in an office. So when I had to pick a career at 16, 17, I thought I'd be a social studies teacher. So my career path was 
went to school for four years, studied history, which was super confusing for me because what you learned didn't match what I was actually going to do in the real world. And so you spend all this money getting all these student loans, studying things that you weren't ever going to use. I went off and was able to earn a master's degree in, in education and social studies, got to the end of my student teaching and just felt like, did I miss it? Because my heart was not into it. And I'll tell you why. The school system had changed so much. I grew up in upstate New York and my heart has always been for people. I've always, since a young kid, and you had talked about this earlier, when I would hear a John Maxwell, my heart would stir. And why it would stir is I was like, God, there is no difference between John Maxwell and me. You're no respecter of persons. How you use one person is how you use another. When I saw, you know, Billy Graham and his crusades, when I think of individuals that have made lasting impacts on society, biblical characters, real people, I've just always had this feeling inside if you could do that with me. Now that has manifested over my life and me taking some really wrong turns, trying to force what I felt God mm. was going to do. And I've had to learn how to grow and mature. But why I went down this path of being a teacher is I thought I could shape lives. But what I found is that going through student teaching, now this was, you know, in the 2000s, you know, 2011, 12, um, where uh, teachers were very mindful of like, if you're a male, you can't be in the same room with a young girl. Like, we don't do that. Like, and I, I totally understand why. But I'll never forget, I had a young gal. She was a sophomore in high school. I was teaching social studies as a student teacher. It was 942-ish in the morning. And she had her head down and we were showing a video and I went up to this young gal and I got down on a knee. The classroom's full of kids. So this wasn't anything weird. And she said, what's going on today? She said, Mr. Campbell, uh, I'm pregnant. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, Dave, I was like, what, uh, boy, what, what, what do I say? Like, my heart is to pull you aside and tell you you're going to be okay and you're going to change the world and you're going to do all this stuff, but I can't. And so I had these experiences like this of kids like telling me things that like I couldn't do anything. Yeah. And so I got to the end and I was like, I don't want to be a teacher anymore. And so I just started taking jobs that were offered to me. I had no idea why these doors were opening. They didn't align with the story or the career path. <laughs> My first job out of college outside of working at the Olive Garden, meeting my wife, which Stephanie, I love you. We would wet waiting tables. I took a job selling cars, did that for a year, sold a car to a financial advisor at Morgan Stanley. He, my mom worked for him in 1979. He said, why do you work here? I was like, I don't know. The next thing you know, I got an interview at Morgan Stanley. Didn't even know what a financial advisor was. Came in, went through this interview process by the grace of God, was hired, was in an industry I didn't understand for six years doing financial advising. Absolutely hated it but I love the people component of it. Then I made a career change to work at the business I work at now with the most amazing staff of people. Don't do any of the numbers and figures anymore, but I, I work as our chief brand officer, developing culture, new business development, You know, working with our staff for the people skills and like, how do you deal with people's money? And I say all of that because like you, you talked about looking back, I would have never imagined that yeah. moment, that interaction with that gal that I'd ever be hosting a podcast, let alone co-hosting right. a financial planning podcast. But here I am on this show with Travis all the time. He's yeah. such a genius and he's so smart. And my brain just starts going on like, how do I, how do I bring these ideas home to what he's saying? And the teacher inside of me comes alive. Mm -hmm. And so like, you'll hear me in the show be like, I think Travis, what you're trying to say is X, Y, Z. So why I say all of that is like, I could have never imagined in those seasons of life what I'd be doing now. And I wouldn't have changed a single thing. That's right. But I think so many of us are trying to force a different future because we're not happy with where we are. But I think the exercise that you just gave is so practical that any of us can do. You got four burners in your life. Be super honest about where you are with each one of those. Yes. Take accountability and then like, let's start to tackle small things. Like if you, if you're not in love with the way you look, you're not going to go from today, tomorrow, standing in the mirror and love yourself. But like, what, what can you also substitute that you're not doing now? I think sometimes when we yo-yo diet or we do things, we we're so desperate for change yes. that we convince ourselves we can do way more than we possibly can. Yep. Like I'm going to nix sugar forever. I'm not going to eat ice cream anymore. I'm done with cake. I'm done with pizza. And then like, you got a birthday party the next 
next day or two yeah. days later. And you do this thing and you told yourself you're never going to do it again. And then you fall a little bit short and you beat yourself up. Yes. So many people are beating themselves up over, again, not overtly like sinful murder, but just bad decisions that you're making yeah. that you just told yourself you would never do again. And so I wonder even in your world, Dave, as you begin to highlight these four areas mm -hmm. and you're, you're honest about what's not going right. Yeah. Do you ever have experiences with individuals through coaching that come back to you and are like, Dave, I know we said that I was going to start addressing X, Y, and Z, but I keep struggling or I keep falling short. And then as a coach, I got to imagine that you're not like, well, that's just the way you're wired. You know, it's okay. We'll move on. Are there strategies maybe for those people that, again, I think you folks are on a podcast because you, you are up for self-discovery. Like you didn't just stumble upon this. You're probably seeking out resources. How do we encourage the people that are trying to do the right things? Um, they've done maybe the four, the four burners or they're like they're on this path to being better, mm -hmm. but they're making some mistakes along the way. Is there anything that they can do you know, to overcome those things or a different way of looking at it? Or can we encourage them through some of the things you've experienced through coaching? Yeah, I love that. Uh, and because that's just so it's, it's practical. That's what life is, right? We can't, mm -hmm. we don't say this is like you said, I'm not, I'm never going to have sugar ever again, right? Well, the likelihood of that actually happening is like really slim to nil right? Um, that's going to come through. And so you're going to have a birthday party. You're going to have things that are going to happen in life to come through with it. So number one, what you're talking about is kind of that process of accountability, right? Uh, is how do we work with that? Whether it's working personal accountability, like holding myself accountable from that standpoint, or if I'm working with a client, like how that accountability side of it's going to go through and, and what does that look like? And I think accountability kind of has a, a negative stigma, like it's this negative deal, because I think most of us have seen it utilized in more of a punitive way. Like it's a punishment, like you said you were going to do this, you didn't do it, therefore, here's your consequence, right, to come through with it. And that's kind of the visual that we have. But what I would say is rather than looking at it from a punitive, it really gives you a chance and a moment of pause to really give a refocus opportunity. Number one, is this truly the right goal? Like is never having sugar the right decision or the right goal for my life? Or is it that I need to be more conscious, more aware of my eating choices and I want to eat healthier and let me define it in a better way, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to kind of go through it. So it may, number one, it's refocusing and determining, do I have the right goal in place? Am I, re am I committed to this goal that I missed, that I said what I was going to do, but I missed it, right? That's going to come through with it. It's being real within why I missed it, right? What happened? Um, was it just circumstances? Was it out of my control or in my control? And being honest about whether it truly is or isn't in uh, your control um, that's going to come through with it. And then it's committing to what the next step is going to be, whether I determine, do I want to have this goal again or not? And it may be that things change, right? So sometimes it may be, look, like I talked earlier about the burners kind of going up and down. This may have been a burning hot, you know, uh, you know, burner of kind of eliminating sugar in my life. But guess what, Steve? I just got a text message or a letter from my wife that said our relationship's on the brink, and we're having a, and and I don't know whether we're going to make it. Well, I'm not sure sugar is the priority at this particular point. That burner might need to shift, and it's like. I need to be committed here and some of the goals or some of the focus needs to be allocated more in this area. So I think it gives those moments that you can kind of have that refocus, right? Have that true conversation with yourself. Did I create the right goal um, that's there? Can I better define it, right? If I can create more texture and more definition around it, it's easier for me to go uh, from that standpoint. Am I recommitting to that or is something's changed, um, you know, that needs to be adapted? So. Too. Yeah. And I just had this thought as you were talking to that there are certain things that are beyond our control. And I think as people, we love sequence. We love discipline. We love knowing what we're doing is making sense. And I think what we can fall into the trap of is when we identify these things and we begin to have breakthrough in them, the, the thing that we are pursuing can very quickly become an idol. It, and it's very hard to recognize sometimes. Because if there's an area of your life where like, let's say you're struggling with eating and you develop a plan that works for you and you start having a sense of control, if every other area of your life seems out of control, 
then you'll spend more time focusing on the thing that you know is working that every time you step on the scale the next day you're losing weight but to what detriment like if financially you've developed a blueprint for you and your family to budget and save money love that but if we're not careful we can remove complete joy and fun because we know we can pinch some pennies together and save some money But what I've seen is that many times then couples fall apart because of financial decisions where it's great that you should be disciplined and you should have accountability in your life. Like you should know what's happening with your money. You should know what you're putting in your mouth. Like those are all things that we're not saying, don't be aware of it. But when we're not careful, we can be so fixated on the thing that we actually know we can control that we lose the joy and we lose the people that are part of the process. And so, again, I think part of it is like, how do you also interject the ability to use the process and the means that you found that are helping you without making sure that you're not losing people in along that journey? And so I think I want to be mindful of your time too, Dave. We normally go folks for about an hour. Is there anything that we left on the table that's still burning a little bit, if you will, that you want to kind of leave as a closing message from your end? Yeah. You know, one one other thing that comes to mind, because you're talking about, you know, hey, I'm listening to this podcast. What can I do now? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and we talked a little bit about, you know, getting definition or really kind of some some texture around direction piece, the mind's eye that kind of gave that exercise that's there. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes we talk about taking an account of what we take in, like digestion wise, what we're eating. Sometimes we'll also even talk about, you know, what we're listening to uh, visually, what we're watching. I think all of those are really important. Um, but one last Last reminder, I think that you that every one of our listeners can actually do right now, right, is taking an assessment of who you surround yourself with. Because That's I great. truly believe that who you surround yourself, like we are a combination, we are an average of those that we hang with. And so it's really important. And one of the, the areas that I challenge clients in is taking an assessment of that and being intentional of, around the individuals that I listen to, that I receive that feedback on. I don't want somebody just telling me how great I am. I need somebody that's going to speak truth to me, right? Uh, From that standpoint. But I also don't want somebody that's just trying to beat me down, right? And kind of hold me, right? That whole illustration of crabs holding crabs in the bucket. You never have to put a lid on a crab bucket because the crabs will keep themselves uh, in there. They won't allow somebody to step out of that. Well, that's part of that whole proximity of people that I hang with. To me, I think it's important to have, number one, it's it's important to have somebody that's maybe a mentor figure, right? Somebody that actually, that I know authentically, that's just not this facade, but actually they're, they, they're, they more embodied, like they, they, they're truthful. Um, they've kind of, they're a little further along the journey than I am, uh, that maybe can speak in like some wisdom and truth, right. Uh, and finding someone that I can trust in that area. I think it's really important to have individuals that are peers, right. This peer accountability side that we talked about earlier also, but the last, one I think a lot of people forget about is that I think will help out significantly is finding someone I can pour into. Yeah. Finding someone that I can help along that, because like you said earlier, right, there are things that happened in your life, right, that you've been able to draw upon and that you didn't even realize how then they'll be able to be able to use for someone else that's going to go through. And I believe that of every one of us, every one of us have a journey, every one of us have a story, and every one of us have value that we can deliver to someone else that it, that they need to hear, that they can you can help them either make a better decision than what you made right? During that situation or things that you learned, et cetera. But I believe being able to pour into somebody and mentor in that area is, is, is absolutely critical uh, for our own journeys uh, also is that we constantly have, you know, those three categories in our life. Yeah. And I think even fine tuning and even more, um, it seems like beyond ever before we align ourselves with people that kind of see the world that we do. You know, it's very rare that your best friend is like completely the opposite worldview and you just like gel. So we're talking about the fact that you're doing life with people that see the world that you are. But if you fine tune it even more, I think sometimes there are people that even though if we align with how we see the world, do not bring the best parts out of us. Mm -hmm. This may manifest itself and not be like they're diminishing towards you. But are there people in your life that every time you with them are gossiping about other people? 
And what you find is that you're being dragged into something that like, you know, you don't want to be a part of That's where right. again, you can, you can be talking about people and, you know, not even realize what you're doing. You're trying to build yourself up by, by bringing other people down, you know, are there individuals that again, if you're on a path to healthy eating, you know, just maybe they're not there. This is very different from saying like, Hey, just don't go write people off and disown them and not text them That's back right. and ghost them. Absolutely. But they're like, dude, what happened to our relationship? But yeah. Is there going to come a point, and why does this matter? Because your marriage is on the line. Mm -hmm. If you are going out with friends, girlfriends, or guy friends, and they are changing the way that you are, who is usually the one suffering is your spouse. Because yep. when you come home and they say, babe, how was your night? Or how was guy's night? And you begin to say, like, did I ever tell you what was going on with so-and-so or how this was? Most spouses really don't want to listen <laughs> to, to their spouse talk about other people or like how, how much of a, you know, crap show somebody is. They want to deal with their own relationship with you and pour into you. These are very small things that if we don't take personal responsibility for, yep. we may be destroying the relationships that are most important to us because we're not taking inventory of what we're allowing into our life, what we're listening to podcasts, what we're looking at on social media, the things that we're feeding. And folks, if you're not paying attention, your cell phone is feeding you what you like to look at. 100%. If you're not careful, you can be digesting things you were never supposed to have happen. And then you wonder why you're far from Jesus. And then you yeah. wonder why your relationship with your spouse isn't where it should be. It's because you're allowing things that, again, are not massively on the scene as evil, but they're yes. very small things that are the small foxes that are getting into the vineyard and destroying relationships. So I love what you said about being mindful of who we're doing life with. I would just take it a step further and, and be honest about those four pillars. If one of them is relational, mm -hmm. think about all the people you know, colleagues, you spend 70 to 80% of your life with people either in a building or virtually are the people that you work with building into your life so that when you come home, you're the person you want to be. And if there are people that are just negative or bringing the world down, it might be worth having a conversation with them that like, Hey, I don't appreciate that we do this every day. And if they yes. don't receive that, it might not be the right relationship, right. but you owe it to yourself. You owe it to your spouse. You owe it to your kids to show up as the best version of yourself you can be. And sometimes there are just things that we're allowing to linger a little bit too long. And then we don't, we don't know why we're not happy. We don't understand why we're so negative. We don't know why we just snapped at our spouse who didn't do anything wrong. And it's like, cause there's all these other things that are eating at you. So I want to make sure that we get people some resources, Dave, um, after the show, we're going to put some information in the show notes. If they want to get in contact with you and your team folks, there, there is no shame. Just like I went through depression with yes. Carl Binger. If you've struggled with depression, raise your hand and get help. Do not That's believe right. the lie that like you got to figure it out and think better thoughts. Sometimes, whether you're in business or in personal life, if your business could use a little boost, maybe it's time to get in touch with individuals like Dave and his team. Because if we, the, the real life change that I think we want to experience is sometimes other on the other side of the help that we don't even know we need. So we'll put information in the show notes. Dave, you're an absolute rock star. Thank you for taking this journey with me with the one big thing. And to those that know you and are championing here, hope you'll continue to listen to some other episodes because it's the human stories that are coming out right. in every one of these episodes that makes us all real and tangible. And it's the life stories that are giving us, I think, the encouragement we need to go make one more good decision. What would it look like if you could make one more good decision? That, could, right. be, that could be the, the trajectory that you need to real life change. So thanks for being uh, a listener on The One Big Thing. Dave, thanks for being on the show. And until next time, let's move the ball forward together. Awesome. Thank you.